Well, I'm really honored to be here uh, and to moderate this panel and continue the conversation and pragmatically look at what it really means to have a progressive foreign policy. I'm honored to be joined with Maria Jose Espinoza, Terrell Germain Starr, and Ali Wayne. They are all like great stars in foreign policy and you can Google their uh, bios, it's also on the program. Um, but Maria, I want to start with you first. Uh, Maria, among other things, she's the executive director of the Center for Democracy in the Americas. And I just want to get straight to the issue that we're talking about. What does progressive foreign policy mean in Latin America and what the priorities should be? Thanks, Nancy, and great to be here. Um, first of all, I think it's important to remember that Latin America and the Caribbean is often overlooked in US foreign policy, national security debates, media coverage, um, Latino advocacy spaces, all across the board. It's not a priority, and when it is, it's primarily on issues of drugs, crime, immigration. Um, U.S. foreign policy uh, focuses more on international priorities as we speak, the war in Ukraine, Israel-Palestine conflict, tensions with China, you mentioned, all of those. Um, and there is a lack of attention and prioritization of uh, Latin America in the space. This overlooks a region that could be a potential, and it is a potential partner for trade, but also for other issues such as climate change, economic inequalities, um, democracy promotion, but also overlooks the, the composition of the U.S. population where 19% of the population is Hispanic as of 2022. And this is very important. I have to say also that the Latino communities in, in, in the U.S. and abroad are, now, are not strangers to the region, are not strangers to Latin America. Um, we have deep connections with the region, not, not only through our borders, but also through family and economic ties. But what's more important, there is a renewed vision of the region, and we care about a wide range of issues, from economic justice to LGBTQI rights to, um, uh, you know, employment. There are many issues that the community cares about, and that we're not taking account into account in foreign policy and when we're dealing with domestic, also Latino communities in the US. Um, it's also a region that is facing many challenges. I could be talking about a lot of them here. You mentioned a lot that are common to Latin America. We're talking about the uh, social and econom economic inequalities in the region, which are very visible. There are prolonged social crises, and that will be a number one challenge. Number two, and because of these challenges, there is a lack of trust in democratic institutions in the region. There are polls that say that there is a, only a 48% support for democracy in the region as of 2023. Uh, in many ways, democratic governments have not been able to meet the basic needs of the, of the population in the region. We're talking about education, employment, housing, security, democracies are not delivering for the people. That's not unique of Latin America. Number three, populism and uh, author authoritarian trends. This rise in dissatisfaction with democracies brings and empowers these authoritarian trends in the region. And we're seeing the, the, the case of El Salvador right now, but also the election of uh, Javier Milei in Argentina with this uh, libertarian uh, ideology that is even endangering a cooperation mechanisms as Mercosur in the region. And finally, one challenge is people on the move. And, and, and this is really important. Most Latin American countries are countries of origin, transit, and destination of migrants. And just to give you a couple of numbers, the majority of Latin American and Caribbean migrants are living in the Americas, where the numbers double from 2020, there were 8.3 million, 2022, 16.3 million. And as of 2022, 16% of the global total displaced population is hosted in the Americas. And that is a challenge. And it's a challenge that we see here in the US. But there are opportunities, and I'm gonna be quick, we can go into those more. 
There are, there are bright spots in the Americas. There are democratically elected government, progressive governments, such as the case of Chile. There are increased social and political activism focusing on issues such as reproductive rights, racial justice, criminal justice, um, tackling myths and disinformation. Just recently, um, the, the Guatemalan indigenous community rose to support the election of Arevalo in the country, fighting for democracy in the country. We have to pay attention to those movements and, and to those opportunities in the region. And finally, I think there is an opportunity in terms of US foreign policy when it comes to regional migration. Uh, of course, all of the challenges that, that I mentioned are actually a root cause of migration but we cannot ignore that poor U.S. policies are part of the problem, and poor regional policies are part of the problem. And the lack of a regional migration management strategy is part of the problem. The U.S. promoted the LA Declaration of Migration and Protection that 21 countries in the Americas signed. It's a good starting point. It created consensus in the region as to how the governments of the region can get together to manage migration but well, we have a long way to go. Thank you so much, Maria. And I mean, obviously, I feel like there are, the competing challenges are a lot, but thank you for providing this clear picture. And I want to move to Terrell. Um, and your podcast, I mean, Black Diplomat, has brought like really distinct perspectives into foreign policy. Additionally, also your work reporting and working in Ukraine during the war has been incredibly useful and eye-opening for all of us, even more when you saw the difference between those who you thought are on the progressive side and how they changed their views when it came to Palestine. So I want to ask you the same questions. How would a progressive foreign policy in Ukraine and the areas you work on would look like? So one of the things I, I aim to do is to be morally consistent in, in our approaches to every conflict in the world. So when people saw me in Ukraine, I thought that it was very clear that West, that Russia was, was actually waging a genocidal war uh, against Ukraine. And that was perfectly clear uh, via the press conferences that he would make in those of the state, um, the state media uh, companies. And so you all get the 10 second to 15 second sound bites that Putin um, makes about Ukraine or CNN and major networks. If you're somebody who understands Russian uh, in Ukraine, those speeches were played for 15 to 20 minutes. And so the same type of genocidal language that the BB administration uses against Palestinians, Putin and his inner core were using against Ukrainians. And so for me, it was not really any benefit of the, uh, any, any uh, question about how I as a progressive thinker ought to be covering this uh, story and being an independent media person, I was able to say things both in the case of Ukraine and then eventually Palestine that people who worked on the staffs of mainstream media wouldn't be able to do. And so I think Right now, uh, however, when I started covering Palestine, I became interested in Palestine, traveled there with, with uh, Matt Doss. What I found was that people who were cheering me on in Ukraine were reviled by my, um, my, my, my uh, commentary from, from Palestine. And it's interesting, it reminded me of uh, Martin Lamont Hill's book. It was called Except for Palestine, right? And what I found was that people were not, um, they were not morally consistent in how we treat uh, all human beings in this world. And that's really the genesis of my work. And so with Ukraine, I think it's really simple. The most, at this point, uh, the most progressive thing that we can do uh, as progressives is support Ukraine with the necessary weapons to defend itself. And I think one of the challenges with that, however, is we, uh, in, we, we've seen so much of our military industrial complex push this war, um, mil militarized approach to dealing with solutions that when, unfortunately, you're dealing with a place like Ukraine where there are really ultimately no alternatives to negotiating with Putin other than defending, empowering Putin to defend itself, I'm not Putin, but Ukraine to defend itself, 
uh, it, it brings up a lot of complex questions about what does it mean to work through NATO and, and the US military to help a country defend itself. And my, my response to that is pretty, um, is, is pretty simple. I think as progressives, we really have to have an intellectual dexterity to distinguish the difference between fueling a, 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 uh, in another Afghanistan or, or, or colonialism in, 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 in South America or the continent of Africa, Middle East, uh, Southeast Asia versus creating a policy whereby we focus on defense and preventing a, a, another hegemony in Russia uh, in, in waging a genocide against the Ukrainian people. And I think that's a tough conversation for many of us to have because we spent so much time fighting and um, fighting against Western imperialism then that I think what's lost in the conversation is that we think that Western imperialism is the primary um, imperialism that exists. And obviously not saying that for everyone in the room, but I think that's a general problem that I, that I personally run into. And so I think that moving forward with the progressive foreign policy, what's really required is for us to really build our relationships with progressive movements in Eastern Europe. And these are folks who feel like they are underappreciated, uh, people who feel like they, they do share some of the same values that many people in this room have. And so part of my work is using my media uh, experience, using my platforms to empower progressive voices out of Ukraine and Poland and elsewhere uh, to, to really, uh, and really to understand what does security mean for them. In the case of, in, in, in many of these countries, it's a matter of pulling back. It's a matter of not looking at every solution through the barrel of a gun. And in the case of Ukraine, unfortunately, there does come a time when we have to use our resources to, to provide those guns to people to defend themselves because we can't push a, um, we can't support a progressive movement in Ukraine if they're dead. It, it, it's, it's, it, it's really that simple. It's really that simple. You, you, can't, you can't push progressivism and encourage progressive movements with people who, who, who are dying and we have the power to stop that. And so my, 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 so, so that's my response to that in with, um, and, and I think that there are a lot of people in Eastern Europe who are looking for us to expand our own definition of what security means and that requires a very rigorous and robust conversation, but it's one that we have to have. Absolutely, and I'm pretty sure so many people in this room are eager to debate and talk about this with us. Um, Ali Wayne, I want to move to you. Um, Ali Wayne is a senior research and advocacy advisor at the Crisis Group. And we were looking at those issues, thinking this is Latin America, this is Ukraine, or what I was talking about in the Middle East. They're all mostly just framed around the issue of great power competition, mainly with China. And you wrote a book in 2022, and the title was America's Great Power Opportunity. What's the opportunity? Well, thank you so much, Nancy. Let me first just say what a, what a privilege it is to be uh, sharing thoughts along uh, in such a gust company, and I also want to say, just since this is the first panel of the day, uh, really my, my compliments to you, Nancy, uh, to Matt, to Dylan, and the rest of the team. Uh, I think that there's a real reckoning within the progressive national security community, a real debate within the progressive national security community about what it means to be a progressive in this space and who gets to be the arbiter uh, of what is a progressive. And so I, I think that this conference couldn't be coming uh, at, a, uh, at a timelier occasion. So really, uh, hats off to, uh, to all of you. Um, I think just a, a few thoughts in terms of, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about great power competition versus opportunity. Well, in part, I chose uh, the phrasing great power opportunity because I wanted it to be a bit of a spin on, on great power competition. And I wanted to suggest that even in a highly contested competitive international system, that there are opportunities to pursue a more affirmative agenda, that there are opportunities to think more uh, constructively. Um, I think the great power competition, analytically, descriptively, I think it captures some important elements of geopolitics. There's no question, as I just said, that the international system is more contested, more congested, more competitive. What I worry about is turning description, that is sort of a description of today's environment, into prescription. And that is to say, d turning a characterization of today's environment into a basis for U.S. foreign policy. 
Um, and I think that it's very important that we not remember, or that we not forget, rather, that competition, it's a means. Competition is not an end in and of itself. And one of the concerns that I have, uh, particularly in the case of, of China, but we could talk about it more broadly, is that absent greater clarity about what it is that you're trying to accomplish in your foreign policy, absent greater clarity about what a steady state looks like for the relationship, what, what our objectives are in foreign policy, there is a risk that competition becomes an end in and of itself rather than as a means to where it is that you're trying to, to go. So that would just be you know, one point on the risk of turning, I think, a, a partial description of the international system into a, a prescription for US foreign policy. Um, and just a few thoughts on, on the US-China relationship itself and what it is that the United States, I would argue, should be trying to accomplish in, in its China policy. You know, my starting point for thinking about the relationship is that China, for all of its competitive liabilities at home, all of its competitive liabilities abroad, I think it's likely to endure as a competitor. Um, and I think if you accept that hypothesis, and it is just that, it is a hypothesis, uh, then the Cold War is perhaps not the best framing. I think we often hear about sort of Cold War 2.0 or a new Cold War, and there's a, there are a lot of lessons that we can mine from the Cold War. There are a lot of lessons that we can mine from history, uh, but I think that there are risks of either overlearning certain lessons or learning the wrong lessons, and even though the Cold War was protracted, we can look back and say that there was a definitive resolution. The United States won, the Soviet Union lost, now, I can't sit up here and definitively rule out the possibility that there will be a definitive resolution to rivalry between the United States and China, but I think the far greater likelihood is that Washington and Beijing will have to contend with one another in perpetuity. And if you accept that hypothesis, then the operative question for the United States is not how to achieve a decisive victory, and indeed, I don't know what a decisive victory would look like vis-a-vis -vis a competitor with which we have so many interdependencies and a competitor that we still need to enlist cooperation on for the full range of transnational challenges. The operative question for the United States is instead not how to achieve a decisive victory, but rather how to conceptualize, how to operationalize, and how to sustain a fraught cohabitation. Uh, and I'll just offer one, you know, one last point on this. If indeed you accept that hypothesis that we're going to be contending with China for a long time, coexisting, cooperating where possible, uh, diplomacy becomes imperative. And that's why conferences such as this one are, are so vital. Uh, I think that diplomacy sometimes gets a bad rap. I think that it sometimes is conflated with weakness, conflated with appeasement. Um, I view diplomacy not as a misguided act of charity. I view diplomacy as an indispensable instrument of foreign policy. It's an indispensable tool in the toolkit. And diplomacy is not something that you do, uh, again, out of kindness to competitors. It's something that you do to advance your own national interests. And so I, I hope that as part of today's conversations uh, that we restore some of the luster that I think has worn off uh, from the word diplomacy. Uh, it's vital. It is an important tool of the toolkit. And we really should be doing all that we can to ensure that we're restoring it to its proper place in US foreign policy. Thank you, Ali. Um, when I was drawing the bleak picture in my opening remarks, I was also very confident that we are able to make the change. These people are why I'm confident. The clarity, and we can disagree and agree about some things, but these are people and you are people who are serious about and intentional about changing the paradigm that we're working within. And again, to be honest and brave, I wanna ask you, Maria, uh, it's not a perfect world, and we don't want to promote ideals. There's always trade-offs. And in your perspective, maybe what would be the priorities and what you would put as the number one or number two issues that you think focusing on would be like an achievable goal? Well, um, I think... For Latin America, it has to be a priority. So that's the number one priority. Okay. And, and for the foreign policy community, for the advocates, the think tank, the policymakers, I think we have a question like, how do we engage with the region to actually get meaningful solutions to the challenges, but also to the opportunities? And, um, and I kind of want to go beyond the issues. We can be talking about several issues here right now. But I kind of want to focus on a couple of buckets that I think are important to our community, to your point on diplomacy, and to, to the importance of having this dialogue and, and, and sort of as a reflection of, of the work that we've been doing in the region. One, 
I think we have to identify the disconnection. If poor US policies are the problem, the disconnection that exists, and you mentioned that, between policymakers and those that are impacted by the policies in the Americas is its underpinning. And I say this with the confidence that I see it when we do advocacy on Capitol Hill on migration, when we work on US-Cuba relations, there is a total, I wouldn't say total, but there is a huge disconnection between policymakers and those impacted by the policies and also by our communities, foreign policy, think tanks, and advocates, and, and those communities. So the second thing would be to expand the policy focus. Go beyond the great power competition. And when we look at the region, we have to think about what the like, countries are thinking, movements are thinking, beyond the traditional focuses that are really heavily focused on security, and think about climate justice, social justice, gender, racial justice. There are so many issues in the region that US foreign policy should understand better and so many movements that should be involved. Three, uh, bridging the gaps. I think it is crucial and to your point that is the priority to bridge the gaps by integrating Latin America in the mainstream US foreign policy discu discussion in a meaningful way. Let's go beyond migration. Let's go beyond Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua. We need to talk about the region in many and diverse ways that are reflective of the realities on the ground. Um, again, you know, very rarely leaders and policymakers interact with the 11 million residents of Cuba, that most of them were born after the imposition of blanket sanctions on the country, or interact with migrants of South and Central America that are in their journey to the US or with border patrol officials at different borders or with NGOs and understanding those realities, it's really key to progressive foreign policy. I think we need to have a collaborative and inclusive approach to foreign policy. And that means um, collaborating with civil society, but this is a two-way approach. We're not coming to you to tell you what to do. We need to listen and to really listen to fresh ideas, fresh perspectives. And when I talk about civil society, I'm talking about civil society in the US and I'm talking about civil society in the region and those that are fighting the fight on the ground, right? And finally, um, I think a little bit more of the nitty gritty of you know foreign policy in this space is that there's been an underinvestment in foreign policy spaces in Washington and in the country for Latin America. And that is for advocacy groups, that is for grassroots organization, but mainly for foreign policy. We have seen the ebbs and flows of philanthropic work, of private foundations supporting the, some of the priorities in Latin America, but then we, we don't see the results that we want to see and the priorities come and go. And so we cannot see long-term results if we don't have a defined strategy. And it has to start by supporting the progressive foreign policy groups, advocates, grassroots, et cetera, but also those impacted populations. And I do think that's another topic that should be a priority for Latin America by bringing the people with real experience to the conversation, by opening pipelines to Afro-Latinos in the conversation. It is really key if we wanna have meaningful solutions. So we can talk about a lot of issues, but we have to fi fix the structure before we get there. So are you saying that people who are impacted by those issues know more than DC? That's so <laughs> radical, Maria. <laughs> well, thank you. And, and that brings me um, to you, Terrell, not just about Ukraine, but also the work that you do through the Black Diplomat. And, and again, like when I mentioned the five R's, these are not theories, they are work that is being done towards that. And the first one, is the most important one, is redrawing the stakeholder map. Um, yeah, so uh, I think uh, that's a good question. So we have to talk about what does foreign policy mean? We talk about foreign policy, but what is it? I, I explain it very simply. It's really about how you view the world and how we should live in it. That's pretty much it. People think that it's calculus or rocket science. It's not. It's really, it really, it really and I look at foreign policy planning the way that we met as, as urban planning. This city, Washington D.C., was, plan was, was planned out. Who decides? Who, who are we going to decide lives here? Where are the business is going to go? Where are the parks? Where are the schools? The world was carved out the same way. 
it doesn't matter what country it is, someone decided that the borders will be here and the people will be there. And, and unfortunately what's happening in this country is that there are just a few select group of people who are white men who decide what a city is gonna look like. Ironically, I say that because the White House is built by enslaved people, but we really have to, um, how do we change that? And it really comes down to empowering ourselves. If it wasn't for me launching my own uh, network, Black Diplomats Media Group now, since I have my official business license in the state of New York, just got it last week, it, it's, right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll have my, my nonprofit status so people will be able to donate, get a tax write off in the next couple of months. But, but my point is that I've achieved more success uh, and, and I'm able to be on the stage right now because I've, I'm essentially paying the boss to be the cost, paying the cost to be the boss. And, and I would not be able to uh, do the work that I'm doing if it weren't for me taking the risk on myself. And so we have to empower ourselves in order to get the things that we want. And so what that also means is we also uh, have a great benefit of having a room full of diverse views of how to change the world. And I think that's a great thing, right? And so, and I'm really happy to talk about the fact that me being somebody who supports Ukraine, I think it's great that we have people who talk about decolonization and pulling back on military industrial complex, and we absolutely need that. We also need voices that, that need to be in the room to say, okay, this is the time when we have to fight. We need all of that, but none of it has to be colonial and imperial in nature. And, and, and so one of the things that people like Tucker Carlson understands very well in, in, in white nationalists and white supremacists is that Tucker Carlson knows jack shit about foreign policy, but this man goes to uh, Hungary and he is in cahoots with Viktor Orban and vice the man to APEC, and he's currently in Russia. And so why does this man who knows jack about foreign policy able to travel to these places? It's very simple. They, they got, he, he, what they understand more so than anything, is that they have a, they, they've convinced themselves that they are under a siege, and the thing that unites them is their whiteness. That's what they get. Here, the people in this room, we have something that's a lot stronger, and it's our diversity of views, and it's the fact that it doesn't matter what, how, what group you come from. We're all here united because we have a vision that's a lot stronger than theirs because our vision will benefit the rest of the world. And we don't have to put a gun to someone's head in order to convince them to be a part of it. That's what we have. And, and so what we have to, but with that vision, however, is it, it comes with a greater challenge. And it means that once we decide to divest from these colonial frameworks, the trajectory financially, politically, and power-wise is going to be a lot harder. Yeah. And so... We have to have an entrepreneurial mindset in addition to our entrepreneur in our aims to, pro, to progress a foreign policy outlook. And that would be in addition to what I, uh, I think that we ought to do moving forward to, to create our own framework to be sustainable. Yeah. Thank you, Terrell. Um, Ali, I want to come to you before I open it for Q&A, uh, you don't have the same problem that these two have. Like everyone thinks China is the priority. There is nothing there. I mean, like two years ago when I would go to traditional funders and talk about like this big vision and interconnectedness and everything, and they are like, but do you work on China? <laughs> it's just like, it's like, yes, but it's connected. Uh, it is a priority, but what what is the priority within the issues related to China from your perspective. Thanks, Nancy. So a, a few, you know, a few priorities. Um, you know, first, I, I would be remiss not to at least, you know, mention, you know, Taiwan, since it's obviously on top of a lot of people's minds. Um, the first imperative for the U.S.-China relationship, and I, I don't mean to sound facetious, but it's otherwise the rest of the conversation becomes moot. We have to avoid war. Uh, we have to avoid a war, whether it's over Taiwan, whether it's over the South China Sea. I've been encouraged uh, over the past several months since President Biden met President Xi. We've seen a real uptick in high-level diplomacy uh, between the United States and China, and not just at the leader level, but also between the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, and his counterpart, Wang Yi, which both Washington and Beijing now call a strategic communication channel, uh, really highlighting the importance of that channel. Economic officials, technology officials, a number of exchanges that are taking place, uh, and those are to the good. Uh, and to those who would say 
that structural forces condemn the United States and China to war, uh, I would, Nancy, use a word that you used in your opening remarks. Structural forces exist, so too, however, does human agency. And I think that one of the charges for all of us here in this room is to ensure that we don't succumb to this fatalism about the inevitability of conflict. Uh, the creativity of human agency can and must override the power of structural forces. And so on the notion of, or on the subject of war, uh, I want to make a few statements here since that is really a foundational imperative for the relationship. War is not inevitable. War has never been inevitable and we must never resign ourselves to believing that war is inevitable. Uh, the, the decision to initiate war is a human one. The decision to terminate war is a human one. Uh, and so again, really elevating the role of, of human agency. Other priorities, assuming we avoid war, and we, we can and we must avoid war. As I said in my opening remarks, I think that the United States and China, um, I do think that they are gonna be contending with one another, uh, maybe not in perpetuity, but certainly for the very long uh, term. Uh, China, unlike the Soviet Union, China is far more economically capable, far more technologically capable uh, than the Soviet Union ever was. It's far more deeply integrated into the international system than the Soviet Union ever was. And so these are two countries that are gonna have to find some way of getting on. And that means that they not only have to avoid war, it means that they also have to ensure that this high-level diplomacy continues so that they carve out a certain baseline of space to talk about transnational issues. Whether it is, uh, and we can go through the familiar litany, whether it's dealing with climate change, whether it's managing nuclear proliferation, whether it's addressing instability in, in the Middle East, which obviously undercuts not only our own national interests, but those of China. So there's a very full agenda on which the United States and China must uh, cooperate. Um, and just a final point that I'll make, um, and I think trying to get away a little bit from sort of zero-sum uh, sort of framings of, of the U.S.-China relationship, um, I think that a precondition for, uh, I talked about in my opening remarks, getting to this kind of uh, durable modus vivendi between the United States and China, I think that a precondition for getting there is a mutual recognition of the other of the other's resilience and the sources of each other's resilience. Um, I think that the United States has many unique competitive advantages that China cannot readily replicate. I think that China has certain unique competitive advantages that the United States can't readily replicate. So they're gonna be contending with one another in perpetuity. I will say, since I am a, I'm a congenital irrepressible optimist, um, I don't think that the United States needs to be fatalistic about this competition. I don't think that the United States needs to be anxious about this uh, competition. Uh, the United States has been written off many times before. Uh, the United States has a story tradition of regenerating itself, of defying prognostications of decline. And if you look at some of the investments that the United States has been making at home over the past few years, you look at the Chips and Science Act, you look at the Infrastructure Bill, uh, you look at the Inflation Reduction Act. If you look at investments that we're making here at home, if you look at the reinvigoration of core U.S. alliances and partnerships abroad, the United States is demonstrating that it can replenish itself at home and abroad. And so I, just to close, I think that in competing with contending with, coexisting uh, with China. Uh, we should think of China um, as an enduring competitor, to be sure, but I think a competitor that's constrained. It's not 10 feet tall. Um, and so keeping that perspective in, in mind, uh, and, and I think also sort of urging everyone in this room and urging you know, members of Congress and urging you know, those who are involved in this space that diplomacy is, is not a dirty word. Diplomacy is indispensable to the work that all of us are doing in our various capacities. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, I want to open it for questions. There's a floating mic uh, just for 15 minutes. So just raise your hand and someone will come to you. And please introduce yourself and ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm Jake Goodman. Um, I just wanted to ask, what do you, Given the fact that there is all this, you know, hyper um, paranoia, I guess is a, is a good way to for term it, in the milit with it, with the military industrial complex over um, China and the you know the concern about like oh we're in this new Cold War with China and stuff like that. What would you say would be the best strategies to trying to convince, you know, the military the to, in trying to convince Congress when appropriating the budget to gravitate more funding towards climate change, healthcare, public transit, and improving, you know, infra infrastructure and, you know, things that will actually bring this country forward all 
altogether instead of prioritizing defense against China? Thanks for the, thanks for the question. I'll, I'll just make a couple of comments. You know, I, I spoke, you know, in, in my remarks, you know, this afternoon, I spoke about perhaps, you know, ways in which we might see a, a recalibration of U.S. foreign policy. But, you know, it takes, it does take two to tango. And I, I would be remiss if I were to suggest that, you know, if you look at sort of the strains in the relationship, you know, there are actions that China is taking both at home and also in, in its near abroad and even beyond that, that are cause for concern. And I don't think that the United States should shrink from competition or should shrink from competing selectively. Uh, there are actions that that require our, our vigilance, uh, point number one. I think that the second point that I would make is that I wouldn't necessarily frame it sort of as an either or, that we either are engaged abroad or we're investing at home. And in fact, I would argue, uh, I, I said earlier that we shouldn't mind too many lessons from the Cold War, but here I think that there is a very important lesson from the Cold War. Our external competitiveness is predicated on our ability to recapacitate or to renew our competitive advantages at home. And so I think to, you know, to your question, I would say, as we think about competing selectively and sustainably with China, our ability to wage that competition in a prudent way, uh, restore the power of our democratic example, it's predicated on the investments that we make at home. If we are able to demonstrate that democracy can deliver, if we are able to demonstrate that we can address in a sustainable way our pressing socioeconomic challenges, that capacity for internal renewal is arguably the single best rebuttal that we can offer to those who would say democracy doesn't work, that authoritarian uh, governance works better. And so I would just say that one, you know, I think that both, uh, that I think that there are actions that China is taking that do merit a response, that do merit selective competition. And I would also say our ability to be successful in competing abroad is intimately tied with and predicated upon our capacity for renewal here at home. Thank you, Ellie. Um, we've got Bill here. Got two questions. Just to note that this is a superstar. Kelsey is our uh, chief editor of the International Policy Journal. That is not right. just. <laughs> uh, yeah, to Terrell's point, um, we absolutely have to support Ukraine, which means we have to work with the military, we have to work with the arms industry. But I think what's happening is they're trying to exploit Ukraine to get all kinds of other goodies that they want, be it prepare for a war with China, be it a nuclear buildup be it calling themselves the arsenal of democracy, be it being able to price gouge. So somehow I think we have to keep an eye on them. We, we can't, I mean, nonprofits don't make weapons, so we gotta work with them. But um, somehow, right. somehow do both, you know, and I think it is very challenging. No, you're absolutely correct. And so, I, and again, like I, um, I really love that my panelists are talking about these, um, these other alternatives, and I hate to be the person that has to deal with Russia, right? Um, you know, about this, because unfortunately, uh, you're absolutely correct about this. And so my solution is pretty simple. It's, um, there is a way in which America can create, you know, can work with, uh, through the NATO alliance to create a defensive posture, one that would ensure uh, Ukraine's sovereignty. One of the reasons why so many uh, countries that were formerly part of the Eastern Bloc wanted to join NATO was to avoid the very problems that Ukraine is going through, right? We're beyond that right now. Um, when you're thinking about what are some ways that we could do to, to, to in, in the short term, um, empower Ukraine is by creating a defensive infrastructure so that they can protect themselves. There certainly can be safeguards to ensure that it doesn't get out of control. And, and I'm all for that. And that would be the number of how many, how many tanks, how many, you know, what their air defense systems uh, infrastructure looks like. Uh, because one thing about it is that Russia has not invaded a NATO country. The most that it's ever done was play around with its airspace in the case of the Baltics, for example, right? Uh, and what we are uh, seeing right now with, with, with Ukraine, uh, however, not however, but uh, also you see that there's a strong democracy, their civil society is strong, is as strong as it's ever been, and that's helping. And so also supporting what does, and more importantly too, and, um, and, and is to create a, 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 uh, a society, a post-war society uh, for Ukraine. What does it look like from a progressive standpoint to support uh, Ukraine in that standpoint, right? Um, and, and, and also, when we are thinking about security for Ukraine, we also have to mainly be an example, right, um, for if we, if Ameri America is leading in the security of Ukraine, 
that means that we have to stop being imperial ourselves. And so unfortunately what's happening is that many of the former military experts that are going to Ukraine giving much needed advice and, 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 and cons consultation got their experience by invading countries where black and brown people live, right? And that's the biggest irony in all of this, and that's where all the, and that's, and that's where the consternation comes in. So that's a very legitimate concern. And I'll end by saying that there is a progressive solution that includes our, supporting Ukraine with arms while putting a cap on what that means for the for, for, for the uh, defense industry, right? Because one one of the things that they need it, Ukraine needs is the 155 millimeter um, artillery rounds, and so there's a way. Again, Russia is is shooting about 10,000 per day, which is a massive amount, right? Um, and Ukraine is shooting roughly half of that. And I think that there's a way that we can give them what they need now and then capping what that would mean for everyone else. But that's a wider conversation. I just want to acknowledge that you're absolutely correct about it. Thank you. We have another question over here. Yes, please. Thank you, Philip Brenner. Uh, I have uh, two related questions. Uh, first is, uh, what do you think CIP can do to help the work that you're doing, which is very impressive? And the second question is, uh, what kind of research do you think that the new journal could provide that would help you in your work? Are you asking that to all three of you? Actually, Kelsey could. <laughs> no, I want to go to Maria. It's like how, I mean, Maria is also a senior fellow at CIP as well. So she. I was going to say, I think, you know, um, for Latin America specifically, opening opportunities in the foreign policy space to have this conversation, that's been a goal of myself and my organization bringing, you know, more of the national security and foreign policy voices to conversations such as regional migration, such as US-Cuba relation or others. And that is key to some of the solutions that we're discussing. So providing this opportunity, I think it's key. And I'm grateful for that. We need more of these opportunities for, for those of us working on issues related to Latin America. And all of the research is welcome. So um, I would say that. Yeah. Ali, do you want to? Just, just as, well. First of all, congratulations on the launch of the journal. I'm really excited to see, excited to see the debates and the discussions. I think it's going to make a really major a series of contributions to the conversations we're having this afternoon. Um, there are many ways, uh, many ways in which this journal could be, I think, immensely important just to you know, the work that I try to do on on a daily basis. Um, I'll just sort of zero in on on one topic or, or one consideration. Um, there's a lot of literature that, and a lot of scholarship, and, and for good reason, that considers um, how the United States can compete more, uh, compete more smartly, you know, vis-a-vis -vis China, compete more, you know, forcefully. And it, it's important. It's important work. Um, there isn't as much literature that says competition to what end, competition, or even competition to what steady state. I think I would like to see to supplement the scholarship that we see. I would like to see some work that looks backward, and that is to say, let's imagine, uh, just for, for argument's sake or for discussion's sake, uh, let's imagine that it's the year 2030 or 2040 or, or 2049, since that, that year gets a lot of uh, attention for good reason. Let's imagine that it's the year 2049, and the United States and China have managed to avoid war, which I hope that they will have managed to avoid war by then, that they've not only managed to avoid war, but they've also managed to find some way of getting on, kind of forging that uh, that modus vivendi that I was talking about earlier, I would love to see some kind of speculative scholarship that says, assuming that they got there, what steps did they take in the intervening or in the previous quarter century? So starting, it's, you know, a quarter century to, uh, to 2049. Uh, so in addition to looking forward and saying, how can we compete more smartly, um, let's take a look back and say, assuming that we get to a good place, uh, what steps did the United States and China take to get there? So I think that that kind of that backward-looking work would supplement the forward-looking work that we see, and that could be a major contribution of the journal. Yeah. Now, and I'll no. very briefly no. add that I would strongly encourage us to, uh, for the journal to include voices from Eastern Europe. For so long, the, the security discourse, um, particularly in the NATO alliance, has been led by Western Europe. And so right now, there's a strong possibility that the Prime Minister of Estonia, for example, is one, she's one of the leading candidates to join the alliance. And again, I'm not 
saying a pro-NATO alliance. I'm just op op operating within the infrastructures that are available right now and, and thinking beyond them, right? Because I don't think that we should have a, a permanent uh, mindset of these large systems, right? Um, and so just including progressive voices in the journal, for example, that talk about what the security means. I've spoken to plenty of people, uh, progressives across Eastern Europe, who say that they can envision a day where NATO doesn't exist. But we don't hear from them, right? But they say this is the system that we're operating right now because regionally that's what we need. Um, as far as we talk about your work and talk about mine, again, um, and again, I'm speaking as a, a, a business owner, um, is that I would definitely contribute to the journal myself, but also you're doing the work right now, which is giving us the CIP is just giving us this space and this platform because there aren't, this is Washington, D.C. These conversations aren't being had anywhere else in any meaningful way. And so just by CIP um, giving us this space to, be, to speak freely uh, without risk, you know, without us having to deal with any reprisals or anything like that, it's just a strong uh, place for us to be. So, it's, so, so the contributions to our work is happening right now. Thank you, Terrell. We have one more question. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, this is Kate Alexander from Madre. I wanted to go back to Terrell, what you said earlier about expanding the definition of security. I think it's related to this conversation. Um, authoritarians in every context in which you've mentioned, but also in all political parties, have really traded on this notion that security and democracy can be guaranteed from the top down. And that's become a really essential pillar of US foreign po policy regardless of the party. I wonder, in your perspective, can security or democracy come from the top down, thinking specifically about lessons from the post 9-11 era? And if not, how would changing the US vision of security as coming from the grassroots up change US policy in the regions in which you work? Oh, that, that's a good question, thank you. So in the regions in which I work, again, I think it starts off with empowering um, progressive voices in Eastern Europe. And I keep saying this, and forgive me if I sound repetitive, but I don't think it's, um, I'm not saying it by accident. I think that so much of the way that we think about being a progressive and, 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 and anti-colonialism, it focuses, um, you know, on South America, Central, you know, uh, South America, um, Africa, uh, people of color, right? And I know it sounds like right, me being a black dude talking about progressivism and, and, and people in Eastern Europe, but I, you know, that's what I focus on. But um, I think that there is a missed opportunity in, in having voices from this part of the world because a lot of the work that we're doing and the things that we're talking about are happening in Warsaw. It's happening in Prague. It's happening in, it's happening in Kiev. It's, it's happening in Slovakia, Slovenia. It's happening in the Baltics. Because those places are, are some of, uh, of the ground zero locations for forced migration, because you know, forced migration for people who are coming in from the middle, middle, middle East. And we saw that multiple occasions with the border situation um, with Syrians that are coming in through um, from, 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 from um, um, Belarus. And so there are issues where, the, where, where people of color are facing challenges within Eastern Europe. And we can't forget about those people either. And so just expanding those to those people and those people of color in those locations will be a big help. There's a larger way that I can frame that, but I want to respect the times, but that's, that's a part of it. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Terrell. I mean, we're out of time, but Maria, I want to give you the last word because particularly this question, we've been talking about a lot over dinners and walks and a lot of things, and I know you have strong opinions about it. Yeah, thank you. I was <laughs> going over. Um, I, I do think we have to redefine the issue of security. Let's think about migration, right? And when we, we're, we're dealing right now with, with, a, with a deal in Congress that talks about this specifically hijacking, you know, meaningful work on migration because of Ukraine and, and other stuff. Um, to me, an issue of security is the way we're treating people at borders, not only at the U.S. border or across the region. That's 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 a threat to national security. And then when we when we think about how we are informing U.S. policy, to my initial point, we are not working 
with the grassroots groups. We're not informing the policy by those affected. I think um, an outdated policy, it's U.S. Cuba policy. People in Cuba are suffering from repression from their own government, economic mismanagement, et cetera, but U.S. policy has been outdated for many years. And there isn't a conversation on the impact of the policies of, on the people of Cuba and how U.S. policy is affecting the, 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 the migration that we're trying to tackle at the border. More than 500,000 Cubans have left the island in the last two years and no one's talking about it. And there is a, a, a responsibility on the Cuban government, but it is clear that it's a responsibility also of you know the region and of the U.S. And we're not, I'm not informing the policies by those that are impacted, the people in Cuba, or even the communities that are migrating to the U.S. right now that bring different perspectives on the situation on the ground. And we're just observing a very outdated policy. So I do think for across the board, and that's only on Cuba, across the board, we have to go we have to see what's what's happening. We have to bring the voices of those impacted to to this space, to this debate, to the research, to you know the halls of Congress, and we have to keep doing that because that's the only way. There's no top-down approach to security in the region. Thank you so much, Maria, and thank you all. It's been really great listening to you because this is just another reason why I'm optimistic despite everything. Please join me to thank I mean our three panelists. <laughs>